Thanks, Greg. I think you're you're a smart guy. I wonder if you've communicated all with the Department of Energy. I attended a public hearing a few weeks ago on their plan to potentially bring in 13 tons of plutonium to Los Alamos National Laboratory to uh, disassemble it, turn it into fuel, and some of it would go to the WIP facility, some of it would go to nuclear power plants. But in their environmental impact st uh, statement, I didn't see much about climate change. And I was wondering, just for example, we have this drought now, what would happen at Los Alamos if they ran out of water? How would they continue to run that facility without water? And that's just one of many potential impacts from climate change that could affect Los Alamos. Uh, yeah, that, that's a, it's about, that was actually one of the, the comments I had, which I, I skipped over. There are nuclear power plants in the country that, of course, rely on water for their cooling. And uh, this past year, several had to be shut down because their water source got to a temperature greater than it was capable of sustaining uh, the cooling nature. Now, for Los Alamos itself, uh, I am not the expert on their processes and, and what they do, but I don't believe water is one of those more critical elements as you would expect to find at a power plant. You know, they're more of a processing plant. Uh, so, I think your point is really good. Uh, it does affect all of our nuclear power stations some have already experienced uh, exactly what you described, um, but I'm not sure that that particular point applies directly to Los Alamos, but uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm speaking a little out of my area of expertise. The questions? Great one up here. Uh, thank you, Colonel. On the last slide that you showed down at the bottom, it said V O A D S. Yeah, I'm sorry. What does that stand for? That stands for Voluntary Organizations Active During Disasters. Thank you. that you're only in res uh, a response team or are you protecting us from a disaster? You know, there's a possibility. What are you doing to protect our water so resources right now? And I feel like that's important. Oh, absolutely. Um, I am uh, one of the members of the uh, drought task force for New Mexico. Uh, it's a... It's a uh, an organization that has been around, I think, um, for probably 10 or 15 years, but it was active uh, several years ago, and I think it was inactive for a couple years, but we have just started back up again. Um, so we have hydrologists, we have the weather service folks and the engineers who are monitoring the levees and the dams and the water flow and, and all of that, getting all of the data together. Um, and again, that's not a very good news story, but uh, what that's leading to are some efforts to bring water in from other areas of the country. So we're starting to... Uh, go ahead. What about protecting the water sources that we already have? Like, you know, having communities restrict their water or worrying about uh, businesses or industry losing water, uh, things like that. Right. Uh, Melita, did you actually want to respond to that? Or? I do, sir. Okay. Um, again, Towns County has a community wildfire protection plan, and in that, what we focus on is protecting our watersheds within the Carson BLM State Forestry Lawn, so anyone on private property. And some of the things that we encourage property owners to do, and what we do with the federal agencies and the state agencies, we partner with them through Tesla Water Conservation. 
And so, as property owners, you can apply through soil and water conservation to receive a grant to do defensible space or sustainable space projects on your property. Um, and what that does is it cuts down the fuels to protect your home in addition to cutting down the sources that draw from those water supplies. So when you look at you know your forest, your, your property, if you live within a forested area, and you like that those big trees all around there and whatnot, that's beautiful to have, but when you're concerned about your watersheds, you're concerned about protecting the water in our community, um, one of the things that you can do is go through soil water conservation, apply for a grant, um, or hire a private contractor to come in and do so, then projects on your property that will help protect that watershed in addition to what we do with the federal partners um, throughout the Carson, the BLM, and the, and the state lands. So if the, the wildfire protection plan can also be found on the Taos County website. That's taoscounty.org. And if you click on the emergency management tab, it'll take you to my page. And on the right hand side, there's a link that takes you to our wildfire protection plan. We just did an update um, in 2010. And today, we, uh, Nathan Sanchez from the planning department did a workshop for the Pinyasco Area Wildfire Protection Plan. If you live in a community that's in Taos County and you want to develop a wildfire protection plan, by all means contact me. We'll get you in touch with State Forestry and we can start the process of getting you a plan together and then helping create some of those different defensible space areas and protecting the watersheds. Is that part of health and security? Is that part of your job? It's, the funding that we receive comes from State Forestry and a lot of it comes from the federal partners. But we work in, in concert with Homeland Security because of the drought and the, the fire protection piece of it. You said that 95% of your funding comes from the federal government and that a large portion of that filters down to local and state island to local governments. Uh, can you talk about a little bit, and maybe talk in a sort of diaphragmatic way, about the New Mexico All Source Intelligence Center, which I believe is part of the state and major urban area fusion centers, mm -hmm. which is part of the emergency operations centers at all levels, uh, national levels. How do these work together? Uh, are they <coughs> part of a larger system? How does that system operate uh, within the state? That's a good question. So um, the fusion center is a federal concept. All 50 states have one, uh, but there are actually, I believe, uh, I think the number is like 78 uh, nationwide right now. So cities have, the larger cities have their own. Uh, Mexico does reside uh, within my department and is co-located with the emergency operation. Center in Santa Fe. Uh, their primary, and again, it's a very small shop, so we have uh, an individual who is focused on cyber. Uh, we have an individual who's focused on infrastructure. We have four analysts that are uh, looking at all different uh, media, uh, working with federal and other state partners to help pass information, receive information, and do some analytics to say, uh, okay, here's, here's a lot of information that's coming in about, uh, say, this cartel or this gang or um, this activity. But what does that mean for New Mexico? So they're involved in uh, both collecting and passing information to folks uh, who they think might benefit from it. And that's, that's one of the, the primary functions uh, that we operate on. One of the downfalls of uh, the Fusion Center system, in, in my personal view, is there's very little standardization. If you've seen one Fusion Center, you've seen one, and they're all different. They all have different uh, levels of focus. They all have different capabilities. They have different sizes. I visited the one in Arizona, and uh, it's... Its fusion center is double 
of what my entire organization is. So uh, they have a very robust capability. They work with all their law enforcement partners. And while we do that, uh, with the FBI, with the local sheriffs, and, and the state police, and what have you, an organization called HIDA, which is the um, High Intensity Drug Trafficking uh, Organization, they work with all of them, but they don't have the presence in their facility like some other fusion centers do. So what they're doing is they're trying to reach out to all parts of New Mexico to get liaisons who will be that central point of uh, information, contact, and flow so that we can start getting more data from across uh, the state and then being able to kind of fuse that together and say, well, what does this mean? Is, this, is there something going on in northern New Mexico that's related to southern New Mexico and we never made that connection before? And, and how can we alert the, pro, the appropriate uh, law enforcement or federal agencies about something that might be going on so that they can truly investigate and have something to go on? I hope that answered a little bit of your question. How do these uh, how does how do these emergency operation centers and you refer to your fusion center versus the operation center in Santa Fe? It sounds like it's part of another agency or department. Um, how do they work in concert uh, to create a system within the state? I believe that Los Alamos has some sort of uh, emergency operations center. They do. Um, are there other operation centers within the state? And are these all under your uh, purview, or, uh, another state department? Uh, how, how do they work in, in concert with one another to gather this, uh, this information? Uh, so the question was uh, Fusion Center related to the EOC, and uh, that's been one of my uh, major efforts for the Fusion Center is to actually become in, totally integrated with our Emergency Operations Center. So if the Emergency Operations Center is stood up for a fire and, um, or you know, pick an incident, uh, the Fusion Center will actually flow in as a uh, liaison piece to start looking at, well, are there risks from this event that will cause uh, looting or cause other uh, man-made type things. Uh, so that they are working together, at least in New Mexico. I, I think that's a national uh, kind of focus to have uh, fusion centers and emergency operations centers work closer together. And your other question about, you know, Los Alamos having one, of course, when the incident happened here, they stood up in the EOC. Uh, Albuquerque has an EOC. I think uh, Las Cruces might, Farmington might. Uh, so there are EOCs across the state, and we work very closely uh, with all the entities through our emergency managers that, that operate those. So there is a lot of coordination and collaboration. Um, but as you learned in the first brief, uh, when the incident happens, they're in control. The state rolls in and provides assistance where we can. So I think you you heard in the uh, we call it the deep freeze instead of I forget the gastronomic whatever whatever he called it but uh, most of our our activity uh, deals with kind of an after the fact uh, providing the funds to help uh, reimburse local activities so that they can regenerate and get back on track. Kate Carson Command Center, is that part of this network, I think, is what you're trying to ask? Uh, locally, we have a um, discussion about the revenue and operations that we
think we need to use the microphone to ask questions because we're recording this and we can't hear anything that you're saying if you don't have the microphone. But I, I think we have, if, if you have one, one response and then we have one more question, and then that's all the time that we have. I think the difference is the, the Kit Carson Regional Command Center is focused more towards the dispatch communications, regional dispatch communication center. And what Taos County has is an emergency operations center that's very similar to the state's, just not as high tech or high speed. Uh, but we do work closely with the state. Um, and each county within the state has an emergency manager or somebody designated to run the emergency operations center if, if there was some type of event. Um, my office is in Yano Quemado, and I work for Taos County and I assist municipalities if they request for my assistance. If they request my assistance, I go out and help them. You're welcome to come out to Yara Kamado. I'm on the north end of the community center, and you can do a full tour of what I've established in the two years that I've been here and what I've continued to work towards. It's number six, Miranda Canyon Road. And you're welcome to come out there Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. And if you're in Santa Fe, I'll show you our years we're uh, physically located at the National Guard headquarters, so it's just south of Santa Fe, off of I-25. Hi, I'm, I gotta say, I'm amazed at your honesty and uh, uh, about the situation that we're in these days, whether it's climate or social or drug cartels or whatever. It, my question, I guess, is: it, it seems that in many different of these categories that you describe, that you have so many different issues that you're dealing with as, an, as a department. Um, why so much time is spent um, tracking drug cartels or, you know, uh, or following social movements? Uh, you know, people read uh, libertarians, could be, or, you know, former military people. And, and these things actually happen where people are disenfranchised and thus they act out. Um, on the way here, I was thinking the biggest threat of terrorism in America is not in fact Al Qaeda, but somebody who's going to walk into a store and start shooting people. And these are really things that you can never predict or prepare for. Um, that said, any thoughts on that or why perhaps people may be motivated to be suspect of you or? You know, the critical, you know, the common critique, you know, it's the government, and he's here to tell us that everything's okay, but in fact you don't, which is... So could you perhaps talk about the social elements of disaster or emergency versus the physical versus the political, possibly, in the sense of uh, a drug war, etc.? Wow. <laughs>
would be a pretty candid uh, representation. I think one of the things that came out of this this evening was that whether we're facing a disaster from an external or environmental source or an internal source or infrastructure, that the greatest danger is, is apathy, really. And that you all are here tonight. Um, that's an important first step. And then I would hope that you would go home and tell all your family and friends that they need to come back next week and hear uh, Patricia Quintana and Nicola Ulibarri talk about global uh, and local water and food needs. And um, I think that that's, again, to re-emphasize the points made tonight, this is the thing that is important about this community, that we can come together and have this dialogue. So again, let's give a, a round of thanks to everybody. Uh, and I hope to see you all next week. Thank you.